Hey, brothers and sisters, it's time for another Bible teaching. Um, get out your uh, Bibles, okay? We're going to answer a question, and we're looking at the harvest of Revelation 14. This is the third time I've attempted to make this video, and I keep trying to throw too much stuff in here because there's so many things that I see that are related, and it's just like, oh, my goodness, i got to tell them. And it gets to be long and complicated and confused, and I... I trying to streamline it so i'm trying here i know as i say over and over i don't do um short well so i got a question and if you got questions to ask them if they're great questions i'll answer them or i may do a video about it um a lot of times some of the comments i get i know somebody's not here. i have to discern oftentimes is somebody looking to learn or to understand or is somebody trying to argue their point, which is not scriptural? And when it gets to the point with people trying to argue their point that's not scriptural, it's better off just to delete and sometimes to mute them. I've got to make those calls. So here's the question. Which resurrection is Revelation 14? Um, I'm sorry, which, which resurrection is Revelation 14, the rapture? Does Revelation 14 and the harvest occur before the bowl judgments? Um, I'm sorry, that was my response. My apologies. The question was this, and I, I went on a little bit. How do you see the harvest, the harvest reaped in Revelation 14, 15, and 16? Also, do you believe the resurrection is happening this year along with the rapture? So before I start, again, ask your questions. I'm good with that. Subscribe. Thank you. Subscribe. I'm going to keep doing videos. Um, harvest comes in three parts. There's the first fruits, the main harvest, and the resurrection to life. Okay? Three parts. Oh, excuse me. First fruits, main harvest, and gleanings. Um, let's look at the first fruits real quick. Let's go to Matthew 27. Um, we're going to go to Matthew 27, but I need to explain a little bit about it first. Um, so anyhow, the Messiah was arose on the Feast of First Fruits. On the Feast of First Fruits, you are to take a sheath of barley and wave it before the priest. All right, makes sense. Follow me there. If not, go back to read about it in, um, Leviticus 23, and actually the barley being almost ripe is the only way you start the month of Nisan. The month of Nisan used to be called Abib, A-B-I-B. If you go back in the Old Testament, pull up the word Abib, and look at the definition, it tells you that the barley is almost ripe. That way, when you come back from 15 to 20 days later for the Feast of first fruits, the barley is ripe and you have first fruits. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, let's move on. So we're going to read in Matthew 27, 50 through 53. I'm really trying to streamline this. Um, here we go. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil to the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When a man would lose his firstborn son, he would take his robe and tear it from top to bottom. God just lost his firstborn son. He knew it was going to happen, but it's interesting. Lots of changes at the temple. Miracles stopped happening. The doors would swing open. All kinds of things as a result of that veil being torn. Anyhow, the veil, and actually it's recorded that it happened 70 years or 40 years before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. 70 minus 40 puts the, uh, it puts this event, the crucifixion of Messiah, at 30 AD. And then behold, the veil was of the temple was torn from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Then the graves were opened, and many bodies of the spirits who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. This one used to always be like, huh? I just read over it. 
okay, a bunch of people popped out of the grave and went around haunting Jerusalem. Is that what this is telling me? Well, kind of, yeah. See, if Messiah, it's a sheath that they would wave. A sheath is a bundle. Messiah could not arise by himself. Because that'd be a stalk. These are the first fruits. Paul saw this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul understood it. 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to start in verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. You know what? If he didn't rise from the dead, the fact that he was crucified would have meant nothing. Because he said he was going to rise. And if he didn't rise, he'd have been a false prophet. And it's become the first fruits. There we go. To those who have fallen asleep. What does fallen asleep mean? That means you have died in Christ. If you've died and you're not in Christ, you're dead. Eternally, you will be dead. You will come back to life, but the life is just going to be thrown into a lake of fire and you might as well just been dead. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Okay, this is the resurrection to life that we're looking at. For Adam all died, and in Christ all shall be made alive. But those in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those are those who are Christ at his coming. Hmm. Interesting. Who gets saved? Who gets saved? Is it Jews or Gentiles we're talking about? Neither. It's 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 who belongs to Christ. Then the end comes and he delivers uh, the kingdom to God the Father. And that word uh, end there is telos, which is goal, and that's the millennial kingdom. All right, so let's go. And um, okay, so this is the first fruits. The rapture, which is in Revelation 4, it's, it's, a, it's all kinds of places. Isaiah 26, um, starting in verse 19, the rapture is the main harvest. You have three parts. You have the first fruits right here, the main harvest, the rapture, and then you have the gleanings. In the main harvest, there's going to be a lot of people. Oh, my goodness, for the last, since the beginning of time, there's people who have died in Christ. Um, yes, it goes back to the Old Testament. You know, Paul keeps talking about how the just, the justified, those who are saved, the just will walk by faith. Where does that come from? Habakkuk, it's Old Testament. All right, so that would be in Revelation 20. Let's look there real quick. And we want to show something. Yeah, I'm not sure if we go to that part of Daniel or not. I don't know if I'm going to streamline this, so we'll see. Revelation 20, verse, starting in 7. Uh, I'm sorry, starting in verse 4. And I saw the throne sat up, and the judgment was submitted to them, and I saw the souls that had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Um, oh, wait a minute. Had been headed. Why were they beheaded? Because they had a witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Hold on to that. You're going to see it again. Who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years ago. So a number of years back, I was in a, a Messianic congregation for like one of my first times. And we started reading the Shema from Deuteronomy 6, and it blew me away. Because it was that point that I realized that the Word of God, how did, what did Christ say? How do we like respond to things? What do we live by? Every word of God. That's actually out of Deuteronomy. Christ was just repeating Torah when he said that in Matthew 4. Uh, but in Deuteronomy 6, that the Word of God, Torah, is to be put on your, to be um, bound to your hand and to your forehead. Is it a coincidence that the mark of the beast is the hand and the forehead? I don't think so, especially since the man of lawlessness, the condition of being without Torah by choice of ignorance, the man of lawlessness is involved. If that makes sense, we're going to see that more in this. All right, so there you have it with the, the harvest. Um, 
quick question, and it ties in here. You know how um, you have the two different resurrections, one where the people didn't take the mark of the beast, and that's really good for them. And a thousand years later, actually, if you read in verse 11 down, you have the great throne judgment. A thousand years later with the dead in Christ rise, that ain't good. That ain't good at all. Um, none of them because they're not written in the book of life so that they are judged. It says the books are open. And I don't want to go back and read and take the time. But the books are open. There are three books. The book of life, the book of deeds, the book of law. The law is what you're supposed to have done. The book of deeds, what you did do. No man can, can judge, withstand that judgment. But if your name's not in the book of life, then you're judged by the other one. We want to be in the book of life. That's what happened to those at the great white throne judgment. So in Revelation 20, you're seeing those who are come to life, that are dead, who come to life, and those who come to death. Okay, let's go to Daniel. And we're going to answer another real quick question here, hopefully quick. There's another question was asked of me. And we're going to try to answer this at the same time. Um, hoping you will do a short video as time allows. I wanted to know about how Daniel 12 ties in with the resurrection. And just and this is a long one. Uh, resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. And they start talking about what it meant by the great shame. And, and Okay, so go to Daniel. Daniel 12, verse 1. And at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. There shall be a time of trouble, tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation. Oh. That phrase, same thing you see in Matthew 24 when Messiah talks about the great tribulation. Same phrase. So when does Michael stand up? When does Michael come to defend Israel? After they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Midpoint of tribulation. That's why the timelines here are times, times, half, times three and a half years. And I did a video on the timelines of Daniel recently. So check that out if you want. You'll get more about this. But um, at, and continuing on in verse one, and at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. We just talked about that. That's the book of life. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Okay. Um, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those are both. Those are the two judge the two judgments that we just saw the people coming out um, at the rapture and those coming out in Revelation 20 when it's good and the ones that a thousand years later come back bad. Here it's put in a verse, Revelation, it puts it in a chapter, it's a thousand years apart. Those who were, okay, the, some to shame and everlasting contempt. We're going to go to a verse about that in a minute to see what that shame and everlasting contempt is. It's not good. And those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament. Do we want to shine like the brightness of the firmament? Do we want to be wise? Of course we do. That would be especially good if you were a virgin waiting on a bridegroom to come. You definitely want to be wise at that point. So what, what do the wise do? Look down in verse 3. You shine like the, the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars of ever, forever and ever. Paul, I forget where it's at. He talks about what does light have to do with dark? What does, you know, um, the temple have to do with Belial? What does righteousness have to do with lawlessness? He gives you all these opposites. The opposite of righteousness is lawlessness, the condition of being without the Torah, either by choice or ignorance. So when you're bringing people to righteousness, you're bringing people to the law, to Torah and understanding of Torah. All right, let's move on. Um, we're going to Revelation 66 and look at that everlasting contempt. I say Revelation 66. No, there is no Revelation 66. Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. 
the very end of it all, we're actually going to be looking at the Millennial Kingdom in Isaiah 66. But it explains what that is. Here we go. Almost there. I should be doing it up on my computer. It's quicker and easier, but I'm not. Revelation 66, near the end of that chapter, it's talking about who's not going to make it. Um, in verse 17, to those who sanctify and purify themselves and go into the garden after an idol in the midst, you know, pagan idol idolatry. Those who are eating swine flesh. The rapture would happen. Would you want to be eating a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich or having a pork barbecue? Oh, anyhow, um, go to 22. For as the new heavens and new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, does the Lord. So, so shall your descendants and your name remain. So this is for forever and for forever and forever and ever and ever into eternity during the millennial, during not just the millennial kingdom, the new heavens and new earth, right? You follow that? And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another to another, um, keep in mind when you see the new moon, what are the sun and the moon for? Signs and seasons. Genesis 1.14, that word seasons is Moet. It's the appointed times of the Lord, the feast days. So those are still going to be in existence here. That's the purpose of the moon, sun and the moon. And from one Sabbath to another. So the Sabbaths aren't, aren't abolished, and those feast days are also Sabbaths. All flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. And they shall go, here, catch this. And they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who transgressed against me. For their worm, that's like the innermost being, their spirit, their thing that makes them them, does not die, and their fire is not quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. That's everlasting shame and everlasting contempt, because we're going to be looking down upon them forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. I don't think I said enough ever. Okay? That's... Ugh. Ugh, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be that one that's in that lake of fire forever. You know, smoking and non-smoking. Where are you going? Everybody's got a choice. Smoking section is not good. Right, so there we have the, the answer to the part about the resurrection to life. And three parts. And you have, you have scriptures all through the, the gospel talking about the resurrection to life in terms of a harvest. Three parts. It's the resurrection to life, resurrection of the dead, but the resurrection of life has three parts, and the rapture is one of those parts. Do I believe it's happening this year? That is surreal that it could happen in a couple of weeks. Um, I don't, wouldn't want to give odds or percentages, but I'm not saying it has to. It very well could, and this is the best chance I've seen for that, if that makes sense. All right. So about... Let's go to Matthew, Revelation 14. This is where I got carried away in the other videos and trying to explain too much. I want you. To, I want to try to explain a little bit about the book of Revelation, and it's and I could go on and on forever. But I need you to understand the format and how it's laid out. That makes everything make sense. Uh, first of all, the book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature, which apocalypse means to unveil, to uncover, to reveal, to make known. So this is a roadmap through the end times, but it's told through with 150, excuse me, about 500 references to things in the Old Testament. And if you don't understand what those references are, and I, I haven't found a, uh, a um, list of the 500, you know, uh, apocalyptic references of the book of Revelation. I haven't seen that one. I'd love to see that one. But if you don't understand where the things come from, you're not going to understand what's being said here. Think about the the Revelation 12, the wings of an eagle that you know the Jews get carried off to uh, at your end. Does that mean that the eagles are going to pick them up and take them away like one of the Hobbit movies? Oh, that doesn't mean that. If you go back to um, the Exodus, 
And that it says that remember that God bore you on wings of an eagle. Did wings of an eagle ever carry them away? No, it just means God's protection. So there's all kinds of things. And people often make up their own things and start looking to things in the world that we see here in America or you might see in Canada or Brazil or South Africa or Australia or Germany, wherever you may be watching. And you look at things around you and you try to put them in a revelation. No, it's not how it works. This looks back to the rest of Scripture. All right, so. Revelation 119 gives us a basic outline that John was given. Uh, write the things which you have seen, chapter 1. Write the things which are. Or when did Paul write this? Did I say Paul? John. When did John write this? About 90 AD. Now, a preterist, which is probably the most popular uh, position on end times, because that's the position of the Catholic Church, believes that it's all fulfilled and it's all been done, so don't even look at it. Could be because there's some things that could allude to the Catholic Church that aren't good in here. So it's better to think that it was already fulfilled long before the Catholic Church was created. And and they and I'm right. anyhow, let's go. Let's go on. It's not. It was written in 90 A.D. Okay, approximately. And what is going on in 90 A.D.? That is the Church Age. So the things which are are the letters to the churches. Notice, like in Revelation 2, verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear. What does that mean? Anybody, everybody who has ears, let him hear. If you ever see the phrase, he who has an ear to hear, let them hear, those are just for people who are filled with the Spirit, who are understanding. A lot of people, things just get taken away from them, like seeds that are like on the uh, wayside, and the birds, which is the, were the birds Satan? Satan, yeah. We'll come and take their seeds away. Yeah, that's like he who has an ear to hear, let them hear. Not everybody's going to hear this stuff. But these are for everybody. And it says what the Spirit says to the church is. Each of these letters are for all of the churches. And I would say for all time. Um, because a lot of people will say, well, you know, this is this period. The, the persecuted church in Smyrna is for this period. And they try to do it um chronologically actually there is an order to how these are written it's in the order of the roman mail raid so when you have your roman centurion there like you know time to deliver the mail this is the order in which he's going to be going in all right so those are the things which are and what's the next thing this third part it says and the things which um are and those things will take place after this. This is Revelation 4, 1, and on. Revelation 4, 1, and on. You see the rapture, okay? Let's go to Revelation 4, 1. How does it start? And, and after these things, you see it? After these things, after the church age, this is the rapture. Um, Revelation 4 and 5, after the rapture, John is given a tour of heaven. Revelation 6, what is he given? He's going back to earth and seeing it. Revelation 7. This is the 144,000 seal, which is what we're also going to be looking at in, in Revelation 14. And how does that start? <laughs> after these things. You see, after the church age, they have 140. Um, they have a seven-year ministry. So out here, you're going to see all these people getting saved and all this stuff. The multitude from from the great tribulation getting saved. Guess what? They have a seven year ministry. This is not the rapture at this point. These are those people at the end of tribulation who are coming back to life. All right, let's go to skip um, the two witnesses. They have a three and a half year ministry in Revelation eleven. It's in the middle of tribulation. Okay, so this is kind of like in the middle of tribulation. You're getting a little little like quotation or a little like blurb or whatever in there about them. And their ministry is for three and a half years. Revelation 12, it's all middle of tribulation, things that are happening in the middle of tribulation. And a lot of people say, well, no, 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 Satan was thrown back in Isaiah. We saw it. No, Satan actually has had access to heaven and to earth the entire time since then. What happened in Isaiah is a prophetic, uh, perfect tense of a verb. And Hebraic verbs get very tense, and you can't see it in English. 
I feel sorry for them verbs getting all tense, but you 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 have uh, verbs that'll tell you that it's a temporary commandment, a permanent commandment, or a prophetic perfect tense of a verb. It was said so perfectly as if it already happened. So it's written as if it's already happened because it's uh, the fulfillment is so perfect. We actually see Satan here being thrown down to heaven along with the demons. Halfway through tribulation, this is where he will indwell the Antichrist and things get really ugly for the second half or the Great Tribulation. So Revelation 13 talks all about the, the, the beast of the sea, you know, the Antichrist, the false prophet. Um, you'll notice that the um, false prophet can do all kinds of wonders in the presence of the beast, in the presence of the Antichrist. Why? Because the Antichrist is indwelled by Satan at this point in time, not the same powers as God, because he can't project his power everywhere. It's just in his presence. They're going to either call down like fire from heaven. We know from Torah that's a test. It basically says, it, it is worth going back to read that one. So I'm going to pause and find it real quick. Deuteronomy 13 tells us a little bit about, a bit about what the Antichrist is going to do. It talks about if you see a miracle. Let's just read it. Uh, starting in verse 1 of Deuteronomy 13, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams who gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. If you follow somebody who's telling you to do something opposite of what messiah tells you what christ tells you what scripture tells you what torah tells you then you are their servant you are their slave you are their disciple okay that makes sense hopefully it does paul went to length about that if god tells you to one thing and maybe the catholic church says something else well, god tells you don't eat pig and a catholic church says go ahead and have a ham for easter if you follow the catholic church you follow what somebody else is telling you you are not his. you are being somebody else that's what this is talking about and this is going to show up in tribulation because who called down fire from heaven elijah and the Antichrist will do things that were done in the Bible and tell you to do something else and look at my power. Okay, let's read again. If anyone arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder, and that sign or wonder comes to pass of which you spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. And for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And that's Deuteronomy 6. It's also um, um, in John, John 14, John 13, 14. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. Who wrote Torah? Messiah did. Refer to John 1, 1. Try not to get off on too many tangents here. And I've actually lost where we were. We're in Revelation, talking about the how uh, Revelation is set up. Anyhow, Revelation 13 talks about what's going to happen in the second half of tribulation, what the Antichrist is going to try to accomplish, what he's going to do. Who are the players? It's an introduction to the second half of tribulation. Revelation 13 is the same thing, but from God's side. All right? Um. And we'll see that as we move forward. Revelation 13, Satan's side. Revelation 14, God's side. Introduction to the last half of tribulation. I wanted to go through and look at a lot of these things, but hmm, I will. We're going to start from, you got to do it to get it in. in uh, you got to do this in order for it to be understood. We'll start at verse 6. I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven. Everlasting gospel to preach. Um, 
to those who dwell on the earth, from every tribe, every tongue, every people. Who is being preached to? Who are the who are they trying to witness to during tribulation? Everybody. This is not a Jew thing. A lot of people think um, rapture, church, tribulation, Jews. Wrong answer. As long as it matters, who do you belong to? Sing with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. The fear of God is the beginning of understanding. It's how you start to um, follow him. For the hour of his judgment has come. Has come, already came. This is tribulation. Think, you know, Matthew 24, day and hour, day a thousand years, hour, that last seven years, or the seven years of tribulation. Um, let's skip down. It talks about like how God's going to be pouring out wrath on all these people. And then Revelation 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who have kept the commandments of the God in the faith of Jesus. Notice it's not just the faith of God. It's keeping the commandments of God. Um, who wrote that? Messiah, John 1.1. 1, 1. He is, uh, let me just keep going. I'll stop with that. And then it says in 13 that those who die are blessed, who are those who die in the Lord, because they belong to him, and they will come back to life in a good way. So the reaping and the harvest. Now, here we go. This is the heart of what we want to be talking about. Got here a lot quicker in this video. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And one sat on, and one sat on one like the Son of Man, having his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Obviously, this is Messiah, okay, because of the crown. He is crowned at the rapture. Why do I know that? Because Rosh Hashanah is the coronation of the king. Throughout the rest of the Bible, he's known as the parent prince. All right. Let's go to Daniel 7. And I want to look at the white cloud. This is going to give us the timing of when this happens. Daniel 7. And I could like go on and on for Daniel 7. Oh my goodness, there's so much here. Um, this is about the four beasts. I'm not touching those. I won't get out of here. Where do I want to start? Hmm. All right, here's how we're going to make this simple to get out of Daniel 7 quickly. Uh, go to verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of, Man, Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Same thing we just read about, right? He came to the ancient days and brought him near before him. Then to him was given a dominion and a glory and a kingdom, and all the, nation, all the people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. When does this set up? This is the millennial kingdom. It that starts at the end of tribulation. Do we see a white cloud anywhere else that's linked to the end of tribulation? Matthew 24. Let's go there. another very misunderstood passage with regard to prophecy. Immediately after tribulation, that's where we're at, of those days, the sun will be darkened and moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And this is right. And a post-trib is going to sit here and say, see that? Immediately after tribulation. What don't you understand? And this is like the heart and soul of a post-tribulation rapture. Post-trippers say this. Anyhow, but they, they miss something here, but they don't get beyond immediately after the tribulation rapture. Now, it's wrong. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Tribes, earth, Israel. Seriously. Um, I'm going to keep going. 
And they will see the Son of the Man coming on the cloud with power and great glory. We just read about that. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, one end of heaven to the other. So his elect are in the heavens when he gathers them. Those are the people coming back with him for Armageddon. They're not on the earth. They're in heaven, at least those that were raptured at this point when he comes back. Understand that, that and he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. There are three named trumpets. What, what is the rapture? It's the last trump. The Tiki Gedalia, Gedalia, I pronounce it wrong all the time. It means last trump. It is blown on Rosh Hashanah. It's Rosh Hashanah feast. The trumpets, 100 trumpets, uh, 99 or nine sets of 11 and one last trumpet, which is named the last trumpet. Okay. Um, Matthew didn't have to write about something that uh, Paul would, that John would would talk about later. They knew, like the last trumpet and the trumpet judgments, they knew. Paul did. Paul knew the last trumpet. He knew what it was. The first one was blown in Sinai. Sinai, am I right? But anyhow, um, when the law was first given, um, and the great one is blown on Yom Kippur. This is just things that are known in Judaism. Yom Kippur is the end of tribulation. It's connected with Armageddon, like we see here. But the last trump is connected to the rapture in Rosh Hashanah. This is not, this is not the rapture. But again, we see the son of the son of man coming in on the clouds and the white clouds connected with end times, connected with the end of tribulation. So let's go back to Matthew, excuse me, Revelation 14. And talk about these harvests. And we, the harvest, reaping the harvest of the earth and the grapes of wrath. A lot of people try to make these out to be good things. I don't think they are. And then I looked and behold, in white cloud, and one coming on the son of, like the son of man, having on his head a great crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Okay. And, a, and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice who sat on the cloud, thrust your sip, um, sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap for the harvest of the earth is right. So he shall set, he who sat on the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. Does Messiah ever tell you a parable about reaping the earth? Yes, he does. It's in Matthew 13. Um, I believe these two, these two go together and it goes along with the parable that Messiah told in um, Revelation and Matthew 13, and Matthew 13 is about, about um, wheat, but when we get to the grapes, it brings in the blood of everybody who's going to be killed off during that time during Armageddon. Um, so go to, let's go to Matthew 13. I'm going to do this. I'm going to use my Bible. I got more things marked here. Matthew 13. What's going on in Matthew 13? Will you go back to Matthew 12? And that's where you had the abomination of desolation. What is the abomination of desolation? That is uh, blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Israel did corporately at that point. Because if you read through it, and I'm not going to go through it time reason, time wise, is that Messiah passed the demon out of a person who is mute. They're not hearing or talking. It was understood in that day that only the Messiah could do that. Casting a demon out, yeah, no big deal. Um, in the book of Acts, you had itinerant or traveling Jewish exorcists who were casting out demons in the name of the God that Paul teaches. That's kind of funny if you start thinking about it. But anyhow, um, so they see the people knew, they understood that if you cast out, if, that, you only, that only the Messiah could cast out a demon from somebody who was unable to hear. And that's why they said, oh! It's this in uh, Matthew 12, 23, it says, and the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? That's the Messiah, Ben David. That's the conquering king. And the Pharisees got all upset. They had their conversations. Um, 
And from this point on, Messiah taught in only in parable. And this is where you get into he who has an ear to hear, let them hear. Because the purposes of parables were so that not everybody saw it. All right. So let's look at the parable of the uh, the sower. We're not going to look at that one. Wheat and tares. And it's, sorry. It's in Matthew 13, 24. He put forth um, to them another parable he put forth to them. The kingdom of heaven is like the man who sowed seed in his field. What is the kingdom of heaven? That's the millennial kingdom. When does that come in? End of tribulation. So that's when this harvest is happening. It's the rapture. This is the leanings. Although you're also having harvested the ones that are going to die. And they won't come back to life till the thousand year reign is over. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his wheat. But while he while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went on the way. What are tares? Tares look like wheat, they're black, or their fruit is black and poisonous. What did Messiah talk about just before this? Hmm. Bearing fruit. He was with the sower explained, bearing fruit. Talked a lot about fruit. It's important. The fruit of the tares is black and poisonous. Um, 26. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came to him and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? That's this parable of the sower. Then how does it have tares? He said, an enemy. That's Satan. Um, has done this. And the servants said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, at least you gather up the tares and also uproot the wheat with them. So he's letting everything go until the end of time. Let both grow until the harvest. That's what we're reading about in Matthew 24, uh, Revelation 14. I will say to the reapers, first gather the tares and bind them in the bundles and burn them and gather the wheat into my barn. So the wheat's going to get gathered into the barn. What happens to the tares? Which ones are gathered out first? The tares are. Those are not good. They get gathered. What happens to the tares? Bind them in bundles and to burn them. Let's look at the explanation and see what happens to the tares there. So we're going to look over, it's still in Matthew 13, um, year 41. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom. This is what we're reading about in Revelation 14. He will gather out of his kingdom. Do you want to be gathered out of his kingdom? I don't. All things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. And will cast them into the furnace of fire. That's a lake of fire. Where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. Okay. If you went back, and we're not going there, to Daniel 12. Um, the righteous... The opposite of righteous is lawlessness. Uh, will turn many, uh, will shine forth as the son of the kingdom. We see an explanation of that in Daniel uh, 12, that those are who turn, the, the righteous that will shine brightest are those that turn many to righteousness. Righteousness, the opposite of lawlessness. Um, who are they gathering out of the kingdom? They will cast them into the, I'm um, sorry, uh, 41, and the Son of Man will send out his angels and will gather out of the, his kingdom all that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness condition of being not Torah, either by choice or ignorance. So, when he's harvesting at the end of the seven years of tribulation, how many of the righteous are there on earth to harvest? None. They're dead. They're going to have to be brought back to light. 
the ones alive, like the people at Armageddon, they're going to be killed off. That's what we're reading about in these parables, in this stuff in Re Matthew 14, or Revelation 14. Let's go back to Revelation 14. All right. Give me a second here. We're going to start in 17. And this is really good hammer home that point that it, this is not a resurrection we want to be a part of. Then another angel came out of the temple. Let me make sure I got my notes. Yeah. Another angel came out of my temple, out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Another angel came out from the altar who had the power over fire. In prophecy, what does fire represent? Judgment. And another angel came out of the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud voice uh, to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust your sharp, sharp sickle into the and, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Um, so the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of God's wrath. Do you want to get thrown into the great wine press of God's wrath? I don't think so. Let's keep reading. And the wine press was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridle for 1,600 forlorns. I'm told that's 184 miles, which is the current length of his reel. We see this anyplace else? Yeah. Let's go to Revelation 19. Again, Revelation 14 is talking about what's going to happen in the second half of tribulation. If you don't understand that, you think this is happening before the seal judgments or before the bowl judgments. All right, Revelation 19, I think we start in, uh, we'll start in 15. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule the rod, rod of iron, himself treads the wine press. For the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Does he have a tattoo? No, he wouldn't have a tattoo. Torah tells you no tattoos. What is this then? Okay, I, little side note to the prayer shawl goes around the neck, hangs down on the corner on the knop, the wing. It has the zitzi, that little twist with all the. Uh, 513 or 613 twists and turns represents all the uh, commandments, laws, and judgments of God with a blue line, Messiah running through it. It is, they're twisted in such a way that is the tetragrammaton, the four letters that are the um, God's name. And it would hang down to the thigh. That's what this is. But, so you see the wine press that he's treading it down outside the city. Uh, no question where this is in Revelation 19, we're at the end of tribulation. All right. Does that make sense to you? Let's trace it out further. I want you to keep something in mind here because we're going to see something else as I go on. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. What is that sharp sword? What is the sword that comes out of his mouth? Does he literally have a sword? Sorry. A sword sticking out of his mouth? Well, we know that the sword is, and you probably already said it to yourself, the word of God, right? All right. Let's look at this wine press elsewhere. We're going to go to two other places to look at that. Then we're going to look at how Messiah actually kills people off at Armageddon, because that's what we're looking at here. We don't want to be part of this. Where do we want to go next? Let's go to Isaiah 63. See, when you don't know where these places are, and luckily I've got a good teacher who teaches them, and I've learned some of them, and I still am learning. Never stop learning. 
Yeah, I was told, I was in, I've got a, a number of years. In fact, I kind of quit counting like in NA and AA in recovery and I haven't had a drink or a drug in a long time. Hallelujah. But I remember something that really, a lot of stuff that stuck with me. But if you're green, you're still growing. But if you're ripe, you'll still soon become rotten. So when you're studying the word of God and you're studying prophecy, if you're green, you don't know it all, you're still kind of a greenhorn, you're still learning, you're still studying, you're going to keep growing. But as soon as you got it all figured out, I don't. As soon as you got it all figured out, I may talk like I do, but I'm still learning. You're, if, but if you got it all figured out and you can't learn anymore, you'll soon become rotten. And there's a lot of rotten teachers out there. You know, Isaiah 63, um, starting in verse 1. I don't know how far we're going. And we're going to be going for a little while. Is it? Um, yeah. Who is this who comes from Edom? Edom, what is that? Edom is the descendants of Esau. Now, a lot of the Jews look at the children as Edom or the descendants of Esau. No, it's the Muslim nations. But here, it is representative of all the nations that are going to come against Jerusalem during Armageddon. He, um, who is this? Who is this who comes from Edom? with dyed garments from Bozrah, um, the one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads the wine? Yeah, so this is the one who is coming against, going against the people from Edom. I have treaded the wine press alone. And a guy like, yeah, no, I don't fight anymore. But when Armageddon comes, I'm going to be right there with my Lord and Savior, and I'm going to be fighting. No, no, Messiah does it by himself. We're witnesses. Seriously, you'll see that later. He just speaks, and it's over. I have trodden the wine press alone, and from the peoples, no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury, and the blood is sprinkled upon my garments. And I have stained all of my robes. I got nothing clean to wear. No, sorry. Um, and I have strained all of my robes for the day of vengeance is in my heart. And the year of my redeemed has come. And I looked, but there was no help. Um, yeah, we'll read this out. And I wondered that there was, was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me. What does the name Messiah mean? What does Jesus mean? Salvation. Yeshua means salvation. That's what we, that's our promise. And my own fury has sustained me. I have trodden down peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury and brought down their strength on the earth. Let's go to Joel 3 and read about this again. Again, you don't know the Old Testament. This is where you start to understand what, because God does nothing without telling us ahead of time. Amos 3, 7. Joel 3, 13. At least starting in 13. Um, actually, let me see where I want to start. Hmm. It started nine. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Think about this as you read it. This is God calling people out, telling them, come to Armageddon. He's going to draw them there. It's here to war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Eat your plowshares into swords. That's the exact opposite of what's going to happen during the Millennial Kingdom when they're beating their swords into plowshares. Okay. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into springs of uh, spears. 
Let the weak say, I am strong. And assemble and come, all you nations. Is this like everybody except the United States? No. All you nations. Not good. And gather together all around. As your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. This is the Jezreel Valley. This is Armageddon. But it also is the, the valley of judgment or the valley of decision, because that's what Jehoshaphat means. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. But in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Sound familiar? Come down, come, go down, for the wine press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. A lot of people. You know, we you know there's at least a 200 man army coming from the east, 200 million man army. Uh, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of the decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark, and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord will also roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake. But the Lord will be our shelter. Um, in Hebrew, it's more of like a stronghold for his people. It also represents tabernacles. The shelter, the tabernacle. The tabernacle period, Sukkot, represents the millennial kingdom. That's what it's going to be for his people. And the strength of the children of Israel. The children of Israel, that mixed multitude. If you're not part of the children of Israel, you're not with Messiah. Um, let's go in two places real quick. How does the Messiah, what's going on at this time? Joel 2 talks about it. Uh, Psalm 2. I want to go there, and then we want to look at how people died during Armageddon. And that's going to be in Zechariah 14. So Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and plot a vain thing? Vain thing. Come to no fruition. This is the armies coming together in Armageddon against Messiah, and it's a vain thing. It's not going to come to fruition. There is nothing good that's going to come out of it for them. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together. It's a unified attack against the Lord and against his anointed, Messiah, the anointed one, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. They think they can defeat him when he comes back. And, and who's controlling these armies at this point? It's the Antichrist who's indwelled by, by Satan. And he wants to win because he wants to be in charge. He does not want Messiah running things here on earth. He who's, what is God's reaction? Verse 4. He who sits in heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Which is kind of a ridiculing mock. You ever laugh at something that's so sad? And it's like you're sort of, sort of laughing because that's how you deal with it. And you can't believe it. You know, that's, I mean, you believe it, you know it, you see it, but you sort of laugh at it. And, and you know what I'm talking about. He shall speak to them in his wrath and, his, and distress them in his deep displeasure. Speak to them in his wrath. That's the sword two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, which is the word of God. I have set my king on my holy hill. Um, yeah, a lot of good stuff here. I want to keep moving along. Go to Zechariah 14. This is already longer than I intended, but a lot shorter than the other ones I tried. Yeah, I don't do short well. Yeah, come on, Dave. Zachariah 14. There we go. 
I got to find it here real quick. I should like highlight this one. In Zechariah 14, look at verse 12. And this is talking about Armageddon. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all of the people who have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall, shall dissolve while they stand on their feet, and their eyes shall dissolve in the sockets, and their tongue shall dissolve in its mouth. And it, um, you can keep reading here. I need to wrap this up. Um, you, know, you think about that description of how people today in uh, Zechariah 14, if you want to get a picture of it, think about Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, and, and, and we tracked down the Nazis that had the the um, the Ark of the Covenant when they opened it. That's what happened. And we'll, the light went out and Indy's all like down there. Him and the girl are saved because they don't look at the light. And not quite the way it's going to happen. Um, but it's interesting that all of the Germans that you know get wiped out there, and then what was Hitler trying to do to do? The millennial reign, the one thousand year reign of the right, the third right. Anyhow, thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed, do so. Get questions, bring them on. Um, I like questions sometimes. Um, Maranatha, brothers and sisters, Maranatha.